Hello, I am Dr. Kimberly Ford. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for part one of a three-part CMEO Pharmacist Central educational series entitled Screening and Interpreting Serologic Results to Inform Treatment Decisions. The CMEO Pharmacist Central series is supported by an educational grant from Gilead Sciences. As I mentioned, I'm Dr. Kimberly Ford. I'm a hepatologist and associate professor of medicine in the section of hepatology, Department of Medicine at Temple University Hospital at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm very happy to welcome today, Dr. Lauren Heineke to the program. Dr. Heineke is an associate professor of pharmacology at the University of Maryland and School of Pharmacy in Baltimore, Maryland. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Dr. Ford. I'm so excited to be here and having this conversation with you about hepatitis B. So let's begin with our learning objective, to initiate discussions with at-risk patients to promote screening for hepatitis B in a pharmacy setting. The World Health Organization introduced the Global Hepatitis Health Sector Strategy in 2016. The GHHS, the first of its kind to focus on viral hepatitis, particularly hepatitis B and C, given their public health burden, aims to eliminate viral hepatitis by year 2030. The strategy calls for a 90% reduction in cases to approximately 900,000 cases through implementation of prevention and vaccine strategies, and a 65% reduction in deaths to under 500,000 deaths through screening, treatment, and monitoring strategies. While we know that hepatitis B virus is a vaccine preventable virus, vaccine rates are alarmingly low. So data from a recent manuscript from Wong and colleagues at Stanford and the Palo Alto VA suggests the rates of vaccination in patients with chronic liver disease, a population at risk for severe liver injury, hepatic decompensation and death, with superimposed hepatitis A and B infection are quite low. So this is data from NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Survey from 2011 through 2018 among patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, chronic hepatitis C infection, as well as alcoholic liver disease. A cohort of approximately 3,000 patients to be exact Rates in this cohort of hepatitis B vaccination were consistently less than 50%. So 38.6% in those with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, approximately 40% in those with hepatitis C infection, and 47.1% in those with alcoholic liver disease. Additionally, rates also seem to be lower in Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites for NAFLD and Hispanics for those with alcoholic liver disease. This group hypothesized the complexities completing the um, vaccination schedule were certainly um, influential in playing a role in these low rates of vaccination. So Lauren, hepatitis B vaccination rates are clearly not where they need to be. Uh, in your estimation, in your opinion, what are some of the barriers to achieving broader vaccination? Absolutely, Kim. And I think that this is, you know, just really demonstrates, I think, the role pharmacists can play in achieving some of these, these vaccination rates and improving our, our vaccine coverage rates. So the CDC vaccination guidelines were published in 2006, but 14 years later, as you've just talked about, many adults are still not protected. And there's probably a few different reasons for this. So I think, first of all, there's complexities in testing. And you're going to talk about those serologic tests that probably maybe gave people nightmares in pharmacy school. But we're going to break it down. Dr. Ford is going to do a really great job um, kind of going over that. There's also complexity in vaccination recommendations that can probably present challenges to clinicians as well. And then I think the other things that come into play are really related to our, our electronic medical record. So I think 
while we've leveraged technology, this is an area where there's risk factors that are not easily identified in our health record. And then there are reminders and pop-ups that have not really been built to really trigger clinicians to think about these patients and, and who need to need to be vaccinated. And then we'll also talk about stigmatization later in the program, but some of the risk factors can be stigmatizing. And so I think that also comes into play. You know, it's very interesting that you bring up this point about the uh, electronic medical record. So my electronic medical record that I utilize every day doesn't have a best practices alert for identifying patients who are at risk for hepatitis B infection and therefore need vaccination. And so my own personal workaround is to integrate a part into my um, notes template that will remind me to review the vaccination record and what their immunity is. But I think it's, it's really important and, and something that we should be thinking about. So uh, back to you again, Lauren, pharmacists are really uh, important in implementing uh, a more appropriate vaccination strategy. What populations are at risk for hepatitis B with whom pharmacists may want to open up a discussion about vaccination status? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think when we think about who's at risk, it's important to remember how the virus is transmitted. So hepatitis B can be transmitted sexually as well as per, uh, percutaneously via things like blood transfusions. Obviously, that would have been prior to 1992, but also in people who uh, use injection drugs. So a lot of what you're seeing on this particular slide is related to those specific risk factors. So that first bullet that you see is at risk through sexual exposure, and there's some additional caveats related to that. One of the things that I really want to be pull, to pull forward, because I think it's an important population um, that's very vulnerable, and we really need to be doing a better job of caring for this population, is men who have sex with men. Um, so I just want to pull that forward because I'm not sure that that would be on a lot of people's radar, but certainly a group that we need to do better with, not just with hepatitis B, but with hepatitis C and, and HIV as well. Um, also, I've already mentioned the injection drug use. So people who have a history of current or recent injection drug use are, are people that we would want to be recommending vaccination for. And, um, and then I've mentioned the percutaneous risk um, or mucosal exposure to blood. That could include, again, just pulling a few things forward that I think are important to, to remember. So hemodialysis patients are particularly at risk as well as our diabetic patients. And so I think those are two groups that maybe we don't always have on our radar as being at risk for hepatitis B, but really by virtue of the medical equipment that's used to treat their diseases and, um, and test uh, the, certainly their blood sugar, that puts these groups at, at higher risk. And as pharmacists, these are people that you can often identify through the medications that they're taking uh, and the refills that you're seeing at, at your pharmacy. And then there's a few other groups who are, are recommended to receive the vaccination. So we want to think about international travelers who are going to countries with higher intermediate levels of endemic hepatitis B. Also people who are living with hepatitis C infection or chronic liver disease, which could include a multitude of diseases, including non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And mm -hmm. um, alcoholic liver disease, of course, we know that that's one of the other big causes of cirrhosis in the United States autoimmune hepatitis as well, and then people who have elevations in their uh, LFT, so AST and ALT that is, are greater than two times the upper limit of normal. We also want to vaccinate people who are infected with human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, uh, individuals who are incarcerated are at higher risk for exposure as well. And then there could be other groups of people who um, we're looking to protect against hepatitis B, even though they don't have a specific risk factor. So um, can you also provide us with an overview of the current vaccines and the vaccination schedules, which would be observed in adults? Absolutely. So this is a great time to talk about our hepatitis B vaccines. Many of you are probably familiar with them. Um, and so just to orient you to what's on your slide on the left hand side, you see the single antigen vaccine. So those would be the vaccines that are aimed at only protecting people against hepatitis B. Um, but as you well know, we have many combination vaccines. So on the right hand side, these are our three options that are combination vaccines that would protect people against not only hepatitis B, but other diseases 
diseases as well. What you're seeing on, on this slide in this figure is on the left-hand column, you have those different vaccines. And then the, the doses are denoted by the numbers and then the timing is in weeks. And the weeks are across that top very top row. So you see it starts at zero in the gray bar um, and it goes from four week intervals all the way up to 24 weeks. So you'll note that the majority of our vaccines are going to be three or four doses. Hepless FB was an exciting addition to our armamentarium of hepatitis B vaccines because it is only two doses. And you'll note that it it's only a month, you know, before we we've got people able to achieve protection. Whereas with our other vaccines, we're looking at, at going out to, to 24 weeks. So much longer time series, um, which I think oftentimes can be difficult to ensure patients achieve that final dose. Certainly we know that more doses do decrease people's adherence with, with vaccination schedules. There's the Angerix B hemodialysis, and you'll note that that's four doses. So immunologically, people on hemodialysis have a, a more difficult time achieving immunity to hepatitis B. So important to, to make sure that you're paying attention to that if, if you're looking to immunize someone with, with hemo, who has hemodialysis. And then the other thing that I just want to point out is that if someone is traveling and has potential exposure for hepatitis B, that twin RICS can be administered as an accelerated series at day one, seven, 21 to 30, and then followed by a fourth dose at 12 months. So just quickly wanted to point that out. So it's important for us to understand what happens when someone becomes infected and what happens um, when they develop chronic disease. And, and Kim, I'm really looking forward to you talking to, about this because I, this is like one of the things that I have such a hard time wrapping my head around. So, so Kim, if you could talk to us about the progression of chronic disease uh, with viral hepatitis B. Sure, um, happy to do so. Uh, so this is a, a really great graphic depiction of the natural history of chronic hepatitis B infection. So this um, first um, phase here is the immune tolerance phase. And it's really characterized by the presence of hepatitis B E antigen. You also have high levels of hepatitis B DNA but when you uh, look at the liver associated enzymes and specifically I'm speaking about ALT, there's really a minimal elevation to no elevation of the ALT. And I think of it just the way that it sounds. So there's active hepatitis B replication going on and your immune system is completely tolerant of that replication. And so when a sample of uh, liver biopsy is obtained and we look at the tissue under the microscope, there really isn't any uh, necroinflammation there. There's no um, significant fibrosis or scarring there. The second phase is the immune clearance or the immune active phase. And that again is characterized by hepatitis B E antigen. So you are seeing hepatitis B viral replication but here we're actually seeing high or fluctuating levels of both hepatitis B DNA and the ALT. One potential outcome of this phase is clearance. So this is described as hepatitis B E antigen seroconversion. So most patients enter this phase of low viral replication and it's characterized by the presence of rather than E antigen to hepatitis B, you're actually seeing E antibody here. You tend to have low or undetectable uh, levels of hepatitis B DNA. You'll have a normal ALT in this phase and little to no um, inflammation on liver biopsy. And then the last phase depicted here is the reactivation phase, which is characterized by, again, the absence of hepatitis B E antigen you may have fluctuating hepatitis B DNA levels, fluctuating ALT, but you certainly have inflammation that would be seen on liver biopsy. And then lastly, though not pictured here, there can be a resolution of infection. And this is when the hepatitis B surface antigen is lost. Great, thank you. That was a really helpful overview. I know that 
understanding this is super important when you're selecting treatment options for these patients. And there, there's just so many nuances to what happens. Um, so when we're thinking about hepatitis B, it's super important to think about, you can't really look at just one time point. It's important to look at all of these labs over a, a period of time to really understand which phase uh, a particular patient is in. This is uh, data from a recent publication from Wong and colleagues that used country-specific chronic hepatitis B rates and data from the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau to determine the number of foreign-born people in the United States with chronic hepatitis B infection. And they found that the number of uh, foreign-born um, persons with chronic hepatitis B infection was approximately 1.47 million. So that's higher than, than has been reported in the past. Um, as you know, a lot of the data, prevalence data that we have for hepatitis B infection really came from NHANES, which uh, is supposed to be a, a population representative sample, but um, perhaps not as representative as once thought. Um, the slide depicts the fact that 59% uh, of uh, foreign born persons with hep uh, B immigrated from Asia, 19% from the Americas, and about 15% uh, from Africa. Therefore, given the number of uh, foreign born individuals with chronic hepatitis B infection when combined with other US adults, it's estimated that more than 2.5 million persons in the United States have chronic hepatitis B infection. Unfortunately, greater than 80% are undiagnosed and less than 50% receive appropriate care. So there's really an argument being made here that even though we um, currently have a standard in place for risk-based screening for hepatitis B infection, that perhaps we should be talking about universal screening, um, maybe a bit controversial <laughs> at the moment, but something that we should definitely think of. And obviously we need to uh, make strides in uh, the linkage to care. So really expanding on that continuum of care as we have done with other viral hepatitis such as hepatitis C infection. So Lauren, I think it's important that we don't just think about foreign born individuals uh, that need to be screened because if we do that, we're going to miss a lot of people with uh, hepatitis B infection uh, and potentially miss people who are susceptible and need vaccination. So what are some of the other at-risk groups that should be screened? Yes, there are certainly high-risk groups that we would absolutely want to make sure that we're thinking about screening and vaccinating if, if they are not protected. And a lot of these will look pretty familiar from our earlier discussion, but the, the prevalence rates are, are higher with hepatitis B in um, as I mentioned, men who have sex with men, of course, the prevalence estimate is not available. Um, I think there's probably a, a lot of reasons for that, um, but I do think probably stigmatization is probably one of them, as well as maybe a lack of knowledge that this group is at higher risk. Um, people who are in prison, prisoners have a higher prevalence rate up to as high as 11.4%. So this would be a really important um, group to screen. Homeless individuals have a higher prevalence rate. Um, the other group that I think is really important to point out and is not going to probably be a surprise to many of you is people who inject drugs. As we've talked about, you have that percutaneous route of, of transmission. So their rate is 11.8% um, and is um, pretty close to the prisoner rate. It's going to be one of our, our higher groups. So really an important important group to, to be, make sure we're screening and then vaccinating if there's that opportunity. Um, we've talked about patients co-infected with hepatitis C and HIV co-infection. And again, remembering that the routes of infection for hepatitis C and HIV are similar to hepatitis B, right? We're talking about percutaneous um, exposure to infected blood. So when you're thinking about hepatitis B, you should also be thinking about those two, two viral illnesses as well. And certainly there are some other special populations that we want to think about. So pregnant women, um, of course, because there is that risk of vertical transmission um, from mother to baby upon birth. 
And that actually brings us to our last bullet in that special populations box is the, the newborns. And I certainly remember my babies being whisked off and getting their hepatitis B vaccination right away. And I'm so grateful for the vaccination program in the US that, that focuses on that. But certainly um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in many countries so that there's access um, mm -hmm. to these vaccines and we can really you know, decrease the, the risk of hepatitis B um, globally. And then we've already talked a little bit, um, but patients with diabetes and other metabolic disorders would be important as well, not only because of the testing supplies that would be used in diabetic patients, but certainly we know that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, is, is quite prevalent. And again, in that group, we really want to prevent any um, additional hits to the liver. So uh, Lauren, I know in the next slide, you're gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, recommendations for screening. I just wanted to uh, make a point about um, hepatitis B infection, particularly in uh, in dr injection drug use. You know, hepatitis B is is pretty infectious, more infectious than HIV, more infectious than Hep C, and um, we can see household contacts um, becoming infected with hepatitis B. Um, and so, I, I think that that uh, is something important to highlight, particularly with uh, injection drug use, who might that person be living with, who are the household contacts, and really extending uh, that network out so that vaccination can be provided uh, to those contacts. We'll jump into the screening recommendations. These first screening recommendations come from the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendations. So that's what that giant acronym at the start of, of your slide recommends So, uh, or stands for. So they recommend screening for hepatitis B infection in adolescents and adults who are at increased risk of infection. So specifically, this is going to include people who were, were foreign born in those areas of high prevalence. If some Someone is U.S. born, but they weren't vaccinated as an infant or parents who were born in regions with very high prevalence, those would be people who should also be screened. Um, we've already talked about um, people who are infected with HIV, um, people who inject drugs, as well as men who have sex with men, and then household contacts or sexual partners of people with hepatitis B infections. So not to be confusing, but uh, would you like to review the CDC recommendations and perhaps highlight some of um, the areas where the recommendations diverge? Absolutely. It feels like this happens in so many areas of medicine, right? We have multiple organizations that give us multiple recommendations. Um, and I do think that really the CDC does add some additional helpful guidance that, again, is probably not going to surprise you, but really putting these two lists together, I think, really gives you a very comprehensive list of, of who you want to be thinking about when we think about screening people. So one of the really important things is to think about people who are requiring immunosuppressive therapy and reactivation of this particular virus. So it's important to screen these patients for hepatitis B and make sure they're not at risk or that we do provide them with vaccine coverage if necessary. So people with end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis, again, there's just risk for exposure by virtue of the equipment that's used to dialyze people. People who have elevated ALT or AST levels, this shouldn't surprise you, but <laughs> someone who is hepatitis B surface antigen positive is someone who has acute or chronic infection. So if you have a mother with a, a positive surface antigen, you would want to make sure that that infant is screened to ensure that they didn't um, have that vertical transmission that we talked about. Um, donors of blood, plasma, organs, tissue, and semen, they need to be screened. People who are sources of blood or body fluid, inmates in correctional facilities, people with hepatitis C infection should be screened. Again, we're talking about an, an, a virus that has the same route of transmission. And again, we're talking about two viruses that can impact the liver. So really increasing our risk for progression to cirrhosis. So making sure we're screening those. Um, and then people with multiple sexual partners of history of sexually transmitted infections. Again, we talked about this virus can be transmitted permucosally. Um, so it is important to, to make sure we're screening sexual partners. So thanks, Lauren. We're going to shift from uh, who to screen to what serologic tests should be ordered as part of uh, the screening process. 
So this is a table outlining risk group as well as recommendations from both the CDC and the US Preventive Services Task Force. Honestly, in clinical practice, I use three tests uh, when I do my screening and they include the hepatitis B surface antigen, the hepatitis B antibody, again, to the surface protein, and then antibody to the hepatitis B core protein. And I just wanna point out that the core antibody comes in two forms or two flavors. One is the IgM, immunoglobulin M, and that's produced during acute infection. The other flavor, the other uh, version of um, the hepatitis B core antibody is IgG, so immunoglobulin G, which is produced after the acute infection has resolved. And so the total, which is what's usually available for people to order, and certainly when I go into my electronic medical record, it's the thing that comes up first when I type in hepatitis B uh, core, that antibody that I'm getting is a total. So it is both the IgM and the IgG. Um, because of the nuances in interpreting these tests, it can really be confusing. And so it's okay for uh, you to use whatever resource you like, whether it's you know, the chart from the CDC outlining uh, what the interpretation of these tests are, or uh, this slide um, here that's been created, there's no concern with having to look this up every time if you need to. So the first scenario here on this slide occurs when the hepatitis B surface antigen, the total hepatitis B core antibody, um, and the hepatitis B core IgM, again, that is in the acute phase, all of those are negative, but the antibody to that surface protein is positive, that person has been vaccinated. The second scenario is when we have an isolated hepatitis B core antibody, and I'm talking about a total antibody. And that can represent a few different clinical scenarios. And I think this is perhaps the most confusing because this you know, um, scenario can go either way. So it can be a false positive. I've certainly seen that in clinical practice. One minute it's positive, the next minute it's negative. And if you follow that serially, it continues to be negative. It can also mean past infection, or it can represent an occult infection. Characteristically, we might see this in a patient who's immunosuppressed. You'll check the hepatitis B DNA and um, it would be present. The third scenario is chronic infection. And we see that when the hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, as well as that total hepatitis B core. And so those patients, if you actually differentiate it out between the IgM and the IgG, they would have the IgG form of that hepatitis B core antibody as well as surface antigen. And just a, um, a point to make is that when we're diagnosing somebody with chronic infection, previously we used to say they, they should have two hepatitis B surface antigens at least six months apart. Really this can be any other marker now six months apart, but um, for epidemiologic studies, it's really difficult to say that they don't have chronic infection. They probably just don't have the appropriate testing six months apart. And so that has been an issue with determining prevalence of hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B infection. Scenario four is past infection with recovery or immunity. And so that's noted when you have a total hepatitis B core that's positive and you have a hepatitis B surface antibody that's positive. Scenario five is acute infection and we see a positive hepatitis B core IgM. In um, my medical system here, the hepatitis B core IgM actually lives in the acute hepatitis panel. So um, it is part of what we uh, utilize to evaluate a patient when they come in um, you know, with elevated aminotransferases, for instance. And so it hides there specifically because we want to use that to determine whether infection is acute. You know, I actually was on service recently, saw a patient 
hepatitis B core IgM comes back positive. We check the surface antigen early in the hospitalization. It's positive, but below the level that they would call positive. And several days after she develops uh, hepatitis B surface antigen that's above that threshold. So uh, an important lesson that this is what you see uh, usually first in acute infection. Scenario six, this is early infection where you can see a positive hepatitis B surface antigen. So it means that there's, you know, replication going on. And then scenario seven is a susceptible person that has uh, negative hepatitis B serologies across the board. Again, I think that this is a lot to take in. Uh, the takeaway points are, there are three tests that we tend to get for screening. That's surface antigen, surface antibody, and the total core. And then for assistance with evaluating the serologies, look to your favorite and most user-friendly source. So serologic results are just one part of this evaluation. If a patient has been found to have a positive surface uh, antigen, the evaluation should also include a few key points here. So a comprehensive history, in which other risk factors for chronic liver disease and potentially hepatocellular carcinoma are sought. It's important to note that hepatitis A vaccination status should also be investigated. Uh, routine laboratory studies should be performed. These include a CBC, chemistries, and an INR. We should have a full assessment of um, serologic testing here for hepatitis B. And as Lauren highlighted, it's important to rule out other viruses that have similar routes of um, infection or acquisition. So it's important to rule out HIV. It's important to test for hepatitis C. Finding out one's hepatitis A status is important and providing vaccination if they're not immune. And then um, also obtaining a hepatitis D, so D as in dog, antibody, to see if uh, the patient has been exposed to hepatitis D. So just as a reminder, hepatitis D can't make copies of itself unless it has the machinery of hepatitis B. Um, and there's also an altered course of chronic infection if hepatitis D is present. Lastly, an assessment of underlying liver fibrosis is required. So there are non-invasive assessments, things like the OPRI and the FIB4 score, um, there's also ultrasound with elastography, which can assess underlying hepatic fibrosis. Um, and if you don't have availability um, for performing elastography, you can also perform just a general abdominal ultrasound as well. Lauren, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, sets of recommendations, which really apply to um, individuals who are engaged in healthcare. People who inject drugs aren't always engaged, but there are certainly opportunities to uh, connect. Could you comment on some of those opportunities for screening in a population of people who inject drugs? Absolutely. And, you know, as we were preparing for, for this talk, we were talking about different touch points that would be opportunities for a community pharmacist to identify um, in their practice. And, and certainly we're going to have plenty of time for discussion. So we would really love to hear about your experiences your, or your thoughts related uh, to this too, because I think the more we, we talk about it, the more we can think about ways to, to really reach this population that can be sometimes difficult to reach. So some of the things that we were thinking about is that certainly there are many standing order programs for naloxone. Um, and so when you're dispensing naloxone, this might be an opportunity to talk about screening and testing for hepatitis B. Um, this person, you know, it, it might not be a person who, uh, who's actively using drugs, but it could be someone who is a household contact of someone who's actively using drugs. And, and that would still be very important. Um, so, I, and I think we need to do it in a way that's non-judgmental and, and really opens the door for conversation. Other potential opportunities is if you're dispensing insulin surgeon syringes without a prescription, that may in, indicate injection drug use and present a, an opportunity for hepatitis B education. And I think it's important to talk about this because I think oftentimes when we talk about harm reduction and substance use disorder, we so often focus on abstinence. And we need to recognize that abstinence might not be 
an option for everybody. So, you know, access to clean needles is important from a public health perspective to be able to help prevent the, the transmission of these viruses. And, and again, I think trying to approach people with, without judgment and really opening the door to conversation so that they know that you care about their health and, and ha ways that, that you can really help reduce harm for them and improve their health in, in whatever ways you're, you're able to, I think is, is going to go a long way and, and people will really appreciate that. COVID-19 testing. So COVID has certainly brought a whole host of challenges, but I think it has also given us a lot of opportunities to get to know our community better um, as pharmacies are serving as such a, a large hub to provide testing and immunization. So perhaps testing could be a, another opportunity. And then lastly, if you've got somebody who you're dispensing their hepatitis C or the, their HIV medications, we've already talked about the routes of transmission being the same for these viruses and knowing that both hepatitis uh, C and HIV can impact liver health it would be really important to make sure that that these patients have been screened for for hepatitis B and hopefully they already have but they might not realize they have been as part of their treatment process so it's also a really great opportunity to just provide some some additional education um, and and I'll be really honest I think sometimes we do the screening test we're actually looking at this in my clinic now to make sure that we follow up on the vaccination when people are eligible absolutely and I, I just wanted to talk briefly about a uh, relationship issue. So there's a lot of stigma associated with hepatitis B that needs to be addressed. How can we as healthcare providers change the narrative? I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about how people contract hepatitis B and a lot of fear about getting the infection. So I think your discussion of household contacts and how we actually contract hepatitis B I think was really helpful to help change that narrative. You know, it's important to understand that there are higher prevalence rates in people who use injection drugs and um, and in men who have sex with men, but it's related to the transmission of the virus and not something inherent in that particular group of people. So the more we understand about the transmission, um, the, the better we can do about taking care of those patients and making sure that they feel comfortable talking to us about these very sensitive issues that are important to, to talk about and address really for their overall health. You know, I think in immigrant communities, there can be concern about presenting for healthcare and really being connected for many different reasons. And uh, I'm not going to claim to understand all those reasons, but I think we've often seen this. I know in my own practice, I have, have seen this occur. And um, certainly it's important to, to let people know that we're here to take care of their health. Really important, I think, to, to try to build that trust and, and starting with just small things and maybe you build your way up to talking about hepatitis B. Maybe it's not what you lead off with, because, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, certainly finding a way to, to build that trust and, and then um, kind of getting to that point. And then I, I mentioned this earlier, but I think that, you know, the more we educate patients, the more they can advocate for themselves. So um, finding patient-friendly language that really provides an open dialogue can be really helpful for, for patients to really move the needle forward in, in terms of, of their own health. So we do have five steps to stop hepatitis B stigma. We need to really know the, the facts, and we've talked about the importance of related to transmission and, and understanding how it is transmitted. It's important to be mindful of your attitude and behavior. So sometimes we have um, a behavior that may really turn patients off and we don't even necessarily realize it's happening. So being really open to that feedback and, and trying to, to understand how we can be less judgmental with what we say and what we do is going going to, to be really important important. Maybe if you have a conversation that doesn't go quite the way you thought it was going to go and you have a trusted colleague who's working with you, you could ask them for some feedback about maybe what you could do differently the next time. So I think being really open to our own biases that we sometimes don't even realize, you know, we have and, and sometimes come across in, in a way that we're not even recognizing. Um, choosing our words wisely. So we do want to be very sensitive. We do want to be aware of the stigma associated with, with some of these things. Um, I think 
the other component to that is making sure that you're in an area where someone is going to feel comfortable talking to this. So if talking about this, so if you have like a busy waiting room and there's 10 patients waiting to pick up their prescriptions, that's probably not going to be helpful. Um, so just being really cognizant of, of who's around you and, and finding a, a quiet private space that you could have that conversation if you feel comfortable with that. Um, educating others, the more people that understand the risk factors for transmission, I think the, the more we can decrease that stigma and people's fear about obtaining the infection, and then taking action. So really increasing awareness about hepatitis B related stigma, um, and then speaking up, being an advocate for people who are infected with viral hepatitis B. So Lauren, you know, medication refills also represent an important opportunity for education about overall, uh, you know, healthy lifestyle. Uh, what are some of the counseling points that you would um, suggest for pharmacists? So if you know somebody who has liver disease, it would be important to remind them that they need to see their liver specialist. It's important to have that screening and, and follow up. Getting the hepatitis A vaccine. So we talked about hepatitis A serology testing and that we have our combination vaccine. So, um, you know, when you're talking about hepatitis B screening, you could also open the conversation to hepatitis A and making people aware that there's vaccines for, for both of those viruses. Um, certainly we know that alcohol Alcohol is one of the leading causes of cirrhosis and need for liver transplant in the United States. So talking with patients about alcohol is really important. I think there's a whole lot we can do to treat our, our viral hepatitis B and C, but if someone continues to, to drink at a rate that, that still causes cirrhosis, you know, have we really done all that we can do? So, you know, as pharmacists, we always talk about over-the-counter medications and supplements, mm -hmm. and I have got to tell you that this is so important to talk about. About, I um, I just give a quick story. So I was on internal medicine and we had a patient who came out of the MICU with fulminant hepatic failure. And no one knew why he had this fulminant hepatic failure. Everything was negative. So as the pharmacist on the team, I said, well, did anyone ask him about herbal supplements? And, and the intern said to me, he doesn't look like that kind of guy. And I was like, I don't know what that guy looks like. Like, what, what are we looking for? Is there a physical exam finding that I missed um, that, that tells you someone's at risk for? Anywho, turns out he was taking kava kava. And that- The known hepatotoxin. Yep, exactly. So, um, so, so, you know, just related to that, that, it's really important to talk with patients with liver disease about herbal remedies and, and vit vitamin supplements, and not even just patients with liver disease, but really everybody. Remember that your liver is what's filtering every before it gets to the rest of your body. So everything you put into your body is, is coming in contact with the liver. Important to eat a healthy diet. And then I'm just, I just want to point out one last thing. One of the really important things with our liver disease patients is to talk about over-the-counter medications for pain, right? People have back pain, they have headaches, they want to be able to know what to reach for in their medicine cabinet. You know, a lot of times we're we're left with acetaminophen, Tylenol, or our NSAIDs, right? Those are our two OTC pain relievers. What, what are your thoughts? How, what do you tell patients with liver disease in terms of what your preference is? So it's pretty important to do this counseling. I think there's a preconceived notion that if you have any liver problem at all, you cannot take any amount of Tylenol and uh, you should be taking NSAIDs. And I think we need to uh, correct that thinking and, and provide more education um, about over-the-counter medications in general. I could not agree more. The other concern I always have with NSAIDs and cirrhosis is they oftentimes have low platelet counts because they're Yep. Um, and, and which, mm -hmm. of course, we know platelets are important um, from, from a bleeding perspective. So, mm -hmm. um, and then certainly there's risk for variceal bleeding if, you know, they've mm -hmm. developed any of those, those varices. So I always worry about my liver patients bleeding. Um, and from a bleeding perspective, we know that NSAIDs are, are not a great option. So I couldn't agree more. I think oftentimes we forget about uh, those risks with bleeding and, and kidney issues related to NSAIDs. Um, and certainly if we keep that acetaminophen dose below that, that two grams, the risk of additional liver injury is going to be very, very low. Mm -hmm. the, the only other point that I would make is that we've seen uh, patients come in with acute on chronic liver failure. So they've had compensated cirrhosis, but they unfortunately took too much acetaminophen. So it's important really to um, adhere to that two gram a, a day uh, limitation 
Um, often you'll see acetaminophen co-formulated with narcotics and patients won't necessarily know that they're taking say Percocet and then they have a headache and they take some Tylenol, they're not feeling well, they take some Theraflu. Well, all of those preparations unfortunately have acetaminophen and uh, you know, very quickly people can get into trouble. So it's, it's just really important to know exactly what you're taking and really limit that acetaminophen intake. I do a lot of the active ingredients label on the over-the-counter um, products. I do a lot of teaching to help people understand how to read those because I, I think that they don't understand how often co-formulated products can change. Um, mm -hmm. So a, another way I think that you can really empower your patient is by taking the extra time to not just recommend an OTC product, but explain how they can look at that active ingredients box on the mm -hmm. OTC product to figure out you know, what exactly is in the product that they're considering taking. Absolutely. Well, this has been a really great discussion, Lauren. Uh, so before we head into questions, let's summarize our discussion with our SMART goals. And so the first of these is to ask patients about hepatitis B vaccine as part of overall wellness checks, identify at risk individuals that should be screened for hepatitis B and provide them with information to promote broader screening, seize opportunities to ask about and educate people who inject drugs about hepatitis B screening, educate patients about their serologic results, and lastly, share resources for uh, dealing with stigma and discrimination with patients and their healthcare team.